Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, July 23rd, 2018. I want to start to alert you that I'll be taking a vacation starting on July 31st. And my actual return date is unclear because as soon as I come back from vacation, we're going to do some major changes to the secret studio here. And I don't know exactly how long that will take before I can get back on online. So uh, just be prepared sometime in August. The Collins Menace will return. So today we reel from more messages from the dear tweeter. And over the weekend, Saturday night, under a Freedom of Information Act request, the New York Times and other media outlets received heavily redacted copies of the FISA court application for the warrant, which was uh, successfully renewed several times, against Carter Page, the obscure Trump campaign aide who made some trips to Moscow and uh, triggered some of the early interest by the investigators of the CIA and the FBI in the potential of uh, some connections between the Trump campaign and Russian operatives. And there's some history here. It goes back to February when the Republican-controlled House Intelligence Committee insisted on issuing, uh, uh, revealing certain portions, but highly selective portions, after they were uh, declassified by President Trump. And when the additional material came out over the weekend, keep in mind we will never see all of this. They use heavy redaction to black out the parts they don't want us to see. And that, of course, leaves us quizzical about whether <laughs> this is just another misleading release of politicized material. At any rate, the dear tweeter is trying to claim that the release of this information is so powerful in its exoneration that the Mueller investigation can now be shut down and should be. <laughs> and as you know, I'm in this bizarre position where I don't have confidence in the secret driven narrative of Russiagate. I certainly don't have any confidence, uh, don't find any credibility in Trump. And I desperately need that third option, none of the above. <laughs> so this leaves us with new material that does support the Democratic House Intelligence Committee's own assertions and the memo that they released that was not even fully permitted to be seen at that point because the White House refused to declassify certain elements of the Democratic counter-memo. Well, now we know that it appears the Democrats were telling the truth. And in a one-page footnote to the original Carter Page FISA court application, they revealed that the information that was used from the Steele dossier came from a document that was described as having been prepared as a, a political report on candidate number one. Now, that clearly referred to Trump. And so the claim that the FISA court was misled in this case appears to be completely unfounded. And I will note, because I am this longtime chronic critic of the FBI, I am a sharp critic of the FISA court, it has no business in our system of government, we shouldn't have a secret star chamber court, ever. But it does exist. And I keep asking, well, when are Democrats and Republicans going to look at the big picture about the FISA court and how the intelligence agencies have repeatedly lied to the judges of that court? And the judges found out. They know it. And most of that stuff is kept secret. But enough has leaked out for us to know <laughs> that we can't trust the FISA court either. So it was Trump who had argued that the warrant application, and therefore the Mueller investigation is invalid, 
Here's his latest crazy tweet. So now we find out that it was indeed the unverified and fake dirty dossier paid for by crooked Hillary Clinton and the DNC that was knowingly and falsely submitted to FISA and which was responsible for stating the totally conflicted, uh, I'm sorry, starting the totally conflicted and discredited Mueller witch hunt. Now, this is just uh, compounded lies, tissues of lies piled one atop the other. And the pile doesn't make any of it true. And a little fact-checking from Philip Bump at the Washington Post. Trump uh, misrepresents the validity of the warrant application. Second, argues Bump, that application was not essential to the launch of the broader investigation into Russian interference. And third, the Mueller investigation has already demonstrated its utility. Well, (laughs) yes, They've put out indictments, mostly of Russians. They have secured some uh, convictions of people who acknowledge that they lied to investigators. But to say that the utility of the investigation has been demonstrated, I consider that to be an open question. Anyway, Bump goes on to say, the redacted, redacted document shows that the dossier was not the only evidence included in the application, and uh, that much of the section is redacted, so it's not clear exactly what information besides the reference to the dossier that the FBI presented to the court. And Bump says it's worth remembering that the part of the warrant application we can see makes up the most of what we know about the application. It's visible because the Nunes memo from the House Intelligence Committee back in February told us what is in there. And Bump goes on, Nuna's presentation that Steele's motivations were hidden by the FBI is faulty. The application says, the FBI speculates that the identified U.S. person was likely looking for information that could be used to discredit Candidate 1 and his campaign. So was that adequate disclosure to the court? That's what the Republicans are going to be quibbling over. It's what Trump is going to try to use to claim that the, you know, the court has been on some sort of a vendetta against him. And I'm sorry, these arguments do not wash. Now, it doesn't mean that I have, you know, renewed credibility for the FISA court. Nothing of the sort would be true. So, in a flurry of tweets today, Trump made these false claims about the surveillance He called the Mueller witch hunt a disgrace to America. And then Tom Fitton, his buddy from Judicial Watch, went on his favorite TV show, Fox and Friends. He got a promo tweet in advance of his appearance. Was there coordination? Was there collusion between Judicial Watch and Don Trump himself? So then Fitton went on TV and characterized the dossier as a Clinton campaign document said it was a fraud and hoax designed to target Trump. Well, the only part that is relevant is that it mentions Carter Page and his July visit to Moscow. So, uh, you know, I've had my own questions about this, and I believe that they are largely addressed by the redacted documents that were released over the weekend. Now, on Friday, I tipped you off that Mike Pompeo, was going to give a speech on Sunday at the Reagan Library aimed at Iranian Americans. And he did. And this resulted in another coordinated effort where Trump uses Twitter to try to build up or echo the comments of others. And so Trump really hit it hard, all caps. The topic, of course, Iran. We'll get to what triggered the president's all caps tweet But he wrote to Iranian President Rouhani, Never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Be cautious. Now Trump is such an idiot because he doesn't recognize how he, his administration, his crony of millionaires and uh, crony cabinet of millionaires and billionaires, he doesn't see how they are perceived by others, including an adversary like Iran. So, President Rouhani said the United States should avoid inciting Iranians against the government 
As the Trump administration is poised to reimpose sanctions suspended under the nuclear deal that Trump breached in May, Rouhani said this: "America should know that peace with Iran is the mother of all peace, and war with Iran is the mother of all wars. You are not in a position to incite the Iranian nation against Iran's security and interests." And that, of course, is what Mike Pompeo's purpose was at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California, last night. He was channeling Colin Powell in Powell's appearance at the United Nations, where he <laughs> told lies. He presented evidence that he wasn't、uh, convinced was true. And his greatest regret is how the Bush administration used him to incite the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And so Pompeo had all this,、uh, you know, very critical language of Iran. And as I read these、uh, quotes, I want you to think of how they apply to Trump and his cabal. Here's a quote from Mike Pompeo: "The level of corruption and wealth among regime leaders shows that Iran is run by something that resembles the mafia more than a government."、Hmm, that could apply to us. Pompeo said that、uh, Rouhani and his foreign minister Javad Zarif. Are merely polished frontmen for the Ayatollah's international con artistry. Their nuclear deal didn't make them moderates; it made them wolves in sheep's clothing. And、uh, you want to apply that to the United States and our role in the Middle East in the last twenty years? And then he went on to say that our propaganda arm, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, is going to launch a new Farsi channel. Now we have an Arabic channel called Al Hura, and I thought that Obama had defunded it and shut it down. But doggone, I saw an Al Hura microphone uh, at uh, some recent, you know, photo opportunity, so it still exists. Anyway, we'll pound Iran with propaganda, and that's really going to make a difference, don't you think? So、uh, this is an effort to create a basis for some military conflict. With Iran, and with Trump's bold, all-caps threat, he reveals himself to be the buffoon who is leading to the isolation of the United States. Because the next stage are these banking sanctions that only the U.S. is involved with, and then we're going to try to convince our allies to stop buying oil from Iran. And that's where Trump is going to find out that the way he has antagonized our so-called allies will leave the United States deeply isolated, as it does Israel's bidding to take on Iran. And last night, Jason Rezaian was at Pompeo's speech. Rezaian was the Washington Post reporter who spent 18 months in the infamous Evin prison. In Tehran, and the speech last night was on the third anniversary of his imprisonment. And he scanned the audience there. He said that the Trump team did attempt to recruit、uh, representatives of the disparate Iranian American community, but some boycotted the event. They don't want to be used in a photo op that will claim that they're. Is a broad swath of Iranian Americans who support takedown of the Ayatollah's regime at any cost. And Rezaian said most of what Pompeo said about the depravity of Iran's rulers was true, but when coupled with U.S. moves that directly hurt Iranians, specifically stiff economic sanctions and the recently upheld travel ban. It is difficult for the administration to support its own claims that the well-being and prosperity of Iranians matter. He went on to say, "I asked members of Pompeo's staff about ways to support Iranian voices inside Iran. That could mean bolstering the strength of civil society through programs that give Iranian private citizens access to educational tools, an unblocked internet, and the opportunity to engage directly with the rest of the world." He said, "None of these seem to be priorities in the current administration strategy for weakening the regime, because, of course." They want to sing along with John McCain, and bomb, 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 bomb Iran. Now Trump has other targets as well. 
He's decided to take on the Washington Post and its owner, Jeff Bezos, who also owns Amazon. They are separate entities, and by all accounts, we haven't seen any real influence of the Washington Post by the interests of Amazon. I could be wrong about that, but I'm not aware of any so far. And what's interesting is that the publisher of the Washington Post was the host of Mike Pompeo at the session, the Iran-bashing session, at the Reagan Library here in California last night. But that didn't stop Trump from attacking in this tweet, quote, the Amazon Washington Post has gone crazy against me ever since they lost the Internet tax case in the Supreme Court two months ago. Next up is the U.S. Post Office, which they use at a fraction of the real cost as their delivery boy for a big percentage of their packages. This is so petty. <laughs> and it is so Trump. And I am not a fan of the Washington Post. I use material when I agree with it, and I criticize material from the Post when I don't. And, as I say, I'm not a fan of Jeff Bezos or the empire he's built at Amazon. But so far, there have been no extreme problems with his ownership of the Washington Post, again, from what I know. So, these are strange days. Rand Paul, the senator from Kentucky, who's all over the map politically, he's the one who tried to get Trump to uh, pick somebody besides Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. But he's been making unusual moves. He defended, he was the about the only Republican who defended Trump's performance next to Putin in Helsinki a week ago. And today he said he's planning to meet with Trump to ask him to revoke the security clearance of former CIA director John Brennan. <laughs> now this one I'm a wobbler on. Because it's mean and petty, and it's in reaction to his comment last week that uh, Trump had operated in a treasonous manner, and he laid out that uh, he'd uh, committed high crimes and misdemeanors, which are uh, basis for impeachment. And so this is just simple payback. Uh, in my view, John Brennan and James Clapper are the likely main writers of the Russiagate narrative, and... In some ways, it's remarkable that Trump hasn't cut off his security clearance. Oh, like when they cut off Jared's. <laughs> Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. People like Joey Perillo, Wendy Gebauer, Paul Tomaselli, and Abby McMillan. They kick in a few bucks every month, and if you're able to do that, and I know not everybody is, I invite you to take out a subscription today. Just visit PeterBCollins.com, find the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. You'll land on the sign-up page, and you can choose $5, $10, $20 a month. With a $50 annual subscription and a mailing address here in the continental U.S., I'll be delighted to send you a bonus gift, a copy of John Dist's new rock and roll CD called American University. So to the claims from the Trump White House and Trump himself, that the release of these uh, partially available, partially redacted FISA court applications zips it all up and, uh, you know, Mueller should just shut down and go home. Well, Charlie Savage did a good job in today's New York Times uh, really explaining the history of this and that Trump declassified this memo back in February to help the Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee who were trying to help Trump. But... This appears to have backfired, even though he's claiming that this is so useful and so vindicating uh, for his claim. I, I mean, the laughable tweet over the weekend was, uh, it ended with this phrase, your favorite president did nothing wrong. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess you can fool some of the people some of the time, and that's enough for Trump to uh, get by. Anyway... Savage writes, on Sunday, Trump nevertheless sought to declare victory. In a series of tweets, he claimed without evidence that the newly disclosed files confirm with little doubt that the Department of Justice and FBI misled the courts. Trump's portrayal is uh, corroborated. It, it instead corroborated rebuttals by Democrats on the House panel 
who had seen the top secret materials and accused Republicans of mischaracterizing them. Now, back in February, Devin Nunes said he hadn't actually read this application. He relied on others, and we're not sure sure who those were because the number of people allowed to see this document were so limited. And so. We learned about the background of how Carter Page was under FBI surveillance going back to uh, 2013, and that's not active.、Uh, let me let me say he he was a subject of an of interest to the FBI, and they were keeping tabs on him. I don't believe that surveillance is the right term, and I shouldn't have used that there. But Savage notes the application contains a page link ex- explanation. It does alert the court that the person who commissioned Steele's research was likely looking for information to discredit Trump's campaign, and so I think that、uh, puts to lie the claim by Republicans that the court was not aware of the origins of some of the evidence being、uh, presented before it. Ray McGovern、uh, published a doozy today with a great headline, and it's a bit of a, a sight pun, if you will. You have to know that Peter Struck, who spells his name S T R Z O K, and Lisa Page were the two people who had a、uh, an adulterous affair going on while they both worked at the FBI, and they traded a lot of text messages that have aroused the ire of many Republicans. Well, what McGovern reports is that on Friday the 13th, Lisa Page, who has left her job as a lawyer at the FBI, testified before a House committee. Uh, and she was asked specifically about an exchange of text messages with Peter Struck, and this occurred just two days after Bob Mueller had been appointed the special counsel, and that, of course, was a result of James Comey's crafty uh, uh, effort to get a friend to put an op-ed in the New York Times demanding a special counsel, and then、uh, his wish was granted. Well.、Uh, Ray McGovern bases this on two things. One is a guy named、uh, I think it's John Solomon, who wrote about this at the、uh, at the website The Hill, and also the late Robert Perry, the founder of Consortium News, who wrote a piece、uh, that was prescient because he used the phrase、uh, on. Let me get the exact date here for you. It was two and a half months before Stroke texted the self-incriminating comment to Page, and Bob Perry wrote a piece at、uh, Consortium News. "Quote: The hysteria over RussiaGate continues to grow, but at its core, there may be no there there." Now that phrase originally was used to put down Oakland, California, and I can't remember now who said it, but she said, "There's no there there." And so Peter Struck,、uh, two days after Bob Mueller was appointed, he sent a text to Lisa Page. You and I both know the odds are nothing. If I thought it was likely, I'd be there, no question. Now he's trying to decide whether to accept a job on the Mueller special counsel in,、uh, investigation or stay at the FBI and hope to rise to the level of assistant director. And Struck wrote. Who gives a fuck about one more AD?、Uh, he says,、uh, "You and I both know the odds are nothing. If I thought it was likely, I'd be there, no question. I hesitate in part because of my gut sense and concern that there's no big there, there." And so McGovern quotes Solomon. So the FBI agents who helped drive the Russia collusion narrative, as well as Rosenstein's decision to appoint Mueller, apparently knew all along that the evidence was going to lead to nothing, and yet they proceeded because they thought there was still the possibility of impeachment. Now that's just a little little moment in time and a little thread, but it speaks volumes. It certainly does. The wrecking crew that Trump presides over. Appears to fear that they might lose control of one or both houses in the midterm November election, and so they're fast tracking the latest wrecking crew demolition operation, which is aimed at the Endangered Species Act, which has been in place for 45 years, and it has safeguarded fragile wildlife while limiting ranching, logging, and other resource extraction. 
In the past two weeks, more than two dozen pieces of legislation, policy initiatives, and amendments designed to weaken the Endangered Species Act have, in, have been introduced or voted on in Congress. So this is a very clear top agenda item. And maybe we're just being distracted by all the tweets and the bimbos and Trump's uh, <laughs> wacky behavior so that the stealth crew can go in there and dismantle as much as possible before their time runs out. And get this, Richard Pombo, a former Republican California congressman who I helped take out. I worked for Pete McCloskey when he came out of retirement to challenge Richard Pombo. It was about 2006, I think. <laughs> and <clears throat> while Pete did not defeat Pombo in the primary, he softened him up, and Pombo was defeated in the general election by Democrat Jerry McNerney, who continues to hold on to that seat. So this is a long-running wish list item of Republicans, and they're making progress. You can see it going on. Gerrymandering is one of the reasons why I believe Democrats are not likely to regain control of the House this November. And today's New York Times lists a bunch of states where local activists have gone to the ballot. Michigan has a proposed constitutional amendment to end gerrymandering. In Missouri, another nonpartisan group called Clean Missouri needed 180,000 signatures to get on the ballot for an anti-gerrymander initiative. They got almost double that, 346,000. In Utah, a group got 75,000 more signatures than required to uh, promote a ballot measure called Better Boundaries. Then you got Colorado, where both the Democratic-run State House and Republican-run Senate voted unanimously in May to place two proposals on the November ballot. And in Ohio, the grassroots were so effective that the state legislature put a measure on the ballot that is watered down, but that would limit gerrymandering, simply not as effectively as the one proposed by voters. And over the last 10 years, here in California, we are the only state that has moved to an independent redistricting commission so that politicians do not get to choose their voters. Lee Fung is a great muckraking reporter. He's over at The Intercept now, and in his latest dispatch, he identifies former members of the Obama administration who've taken that revolving door into high-paying gigs with uh, consulting firms and other shops that uh, are leeches on the Defense Department. Yes, Michelle Flournoy. She was Hillary's top pick to be Defense Secretary. Well, she is now involved in a group called West, Ex, uh, West Exec Advisors. And we'll get to some of the other people in that group in a moment. But uh, she is one of those people who says that people coming out of government are very effective in this kind of work. We like the deputies who have current knowledge, expertise, contacts, and networks. And what we do is a couple of things. We help U.S. companies that are working overseas deal with external risks that might affect their business. And we help tech firms who are trying to figure out how to sell in the public sector space to navigate the DOD. And all of it, of course, makes them extremely wealthy so that they can sacrifice in the future and use that revolving door to go back into government. And our friend Bill Hartung, who is an arms control expert with the Center for International Policy, said the revolving door is a longstanding feature of the military-industrial complex, and it can lead to distorted policy decisions based on the financial interests of former government employees. Uh, Bill, that's a little understated. Uh, Lee Fung also uh, mentions a company called Jigsaw. It's run by Jared Cohen, who is a former top dog for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And uh, he pitched a Jigsaw project in Syria aimed at promoting the rebellion against the Syrian government. So these are not people who are just, uh, you know, buying widgets and taking a commission. These are people who have an impact on policy as well. So let's see who else is populating these companies. Uh, Tony Blinken, a former Deputy Secretary of State under Obama, is a co-founder of West, Ex, West Exec Advisors. And Lisa Monaco works there, too. She was a former counterterrorism advisor to Barack Obama. Startling news that came to me through a, a Facebook post today. There are dozens of international groups 
who have been herded by the American-based Jewish Voice for Peace. And 36 Jewish groups from 15 countries have signed on to a statement supporting boycott, divestment, and sanctions aimed at the state of Israel. And they go out of their way to refute the false claim from Israel and its supporters that supporting BDS is, by definition, anti-Semitic. Quote, as social justice organizations from around the world, we write this letter with growing alarm regarding the targeting of organizations that support Palestinian rights in general and the nonviolent BDS movement. These attacks too often take the form of cynical and false accusations of anti-Semitism that dangerously conflate anti-Jewish racism with opposition to Israel's policies and system of occupation and apartheid. Amen. Democratic establishment figures got the New York Times to give them a front page Sunday position so that they can express their deep fears about you and me. The Socialist Democrats, the Progressive Democrats, the Bernie Krats. Headline reads, Democrats brace as storm brews far to their left. Fiercely liberal voices. Young voters urge party leaders to wake up and pay attention. Oh, that's a real threat, isn't it? Maybe you're one of those people. It was about six weeks ago. I got a rash of robocalls to my cell phone in really bad pidgin English and really shitty uh, recording quality. And they said that if I didn't respond, that cops were coming to arrest me because of a beef with the IRS. Now, it never works that way, and I knew it right off the bat. When I tried to return the call, it was an area code in Buffalo, New York. It was not a working number. Well, last week, the IRS conducted raids in eight states, arrested 21 people for their part in what I believe is that robocall scheme. And finally today, as a man who has worn a beard for 40-plus years now, I support active members in the U.S. Navy who have signed on to a Facebook post using a hashtag, We Want Beards. Because the Navy recently relaxed regulations to allow women to sport ponytails, lock hairstyles, or rope-like strands. And the guys want to be able to get their beards on. I fully support you, gentlemen. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's free, and you're free to share it far and wide. You'll find it on YouTube. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again Happy trails